And I'll talk a little bit, bit about that. Here's N2O on here. Um, and uh, these are some of the replacements for the CFC 11 and 12s, okay? Carbon tetrachloride, uh, some of the others here, and some of the, the minor ones, these are in parts per, th parts per trillion, okay? Parts per trillion levels. So very, very low levels, but extremely high um, global warming potentials. And here's some of the replacement, the HCFCs, how they're increasing in the atmosphere, okay? But their effects as greenhouse gas, they, they don't have as large an effect on ozone destruction and also on, um, on, on warming the planet. Um, this is another uh, image, uh, different, some different sites, measurements taken, showing how it flattened out here. Both the CFC 11 flattened out earlier and the CFC 12, um, and then some of the, the drops in, in some of the other concentrations. Okay, so there's lots of data. So there's lots and lots of data. If you go to the ESRL uh, site, you can look at what the levels of these trace greenhouse gases are doing. Now, there was an article earlier, there was an article, I, it was in May 22nd, 2019, how we traced the mystery, the mystery emissions of CFCs back to Eastern China. Okay, so a little bit of history. Um, in the 1980s, the Montreal Protocol uh, ratified in 1987 it's a treaty that's charged with healing the ozone layer has been wildly successful in causing large reductions of, in emissions of ozone depleting substances. Okay, and I showed you that Twitter um, image. We'll just go back to it. Um, this guy here, okay, this shows the ozone. So the blue hole is the ozone and it shows how it's been um, changing um, since the data is from, this is year 79 all the way up to 2019. And you can see how the hole kind of grew and then has been declining because of the um, Montreal Protocol. Okay, so the uh, Montreal Protocol is often held up as a model of how the international community can work together to tackle climate change. Okay, but new research um, was just published around the time this report came out, this was a, a press release on basically on that new paper. So May of 2019, showing that global emissions of CFC 11 have increased globally since 2013, mostly because of increases in emissions from Eastern China. This is a violation of the Montreal Protocol. Since the global ban on production of CFCs has been in force, since 2010 due to their central role in depleting the stratospheric ozone layer, which protects us from the sun's ultraviolet radiation. Okay, that's the reason why it's been banned, the production of these guys, but they also have enormous global warming potential. So this shows the HCFCs decline uh, because of the Montreal Protocol, but more recent data, you know, this doesn't show you that increase but more recent data does start you know there was a signal that started to emerge in 2013 the rate of decline of the cfc 11 was slowing before it was banned it was used to make insulating foam so any remaining emissions were due to leakages from things that were already from these old foams in buildings and refrigerators and that should decline with time but remote monitoring stations started measuring upticks of CFC-11 again, indicating thousands of tons of new emissions was being made to the atmosphere each year. And uh, these, the, these plumes were obser observed over Korea and Japan. Okay, um, so basically they backtracked and showed, you know, based on the atmospheric uh, wind patterns, these spikes came from nearby industrialized regions and got bigger in 2013. And the computer models showed that the, the, uh, the CFC 11s were then being produced in China, primarily from the Shandong, Hebei and surrounding provinces in, in China. Okay, and they could also find, they could also see that the emissions between 2014 and 2017 were around 7,000 tons per year higher 
and during 2008 to 2012 of the CFC 11. This represented more than a doubling of emissions from the region. It accounts for 40 to 60 percent of the global increase that we've seen since 2013. And in terms of the impact on climate, the new emissions are roughly equivalent to the annual CO2 emissions of London. Okay, so basically, um, so China is supposed to be looking into it to crack down on illegal production. Um, but this is still an ongoing story. And what it's saying is if the major sources of the CFC 11 had been a few hundred kilometers further to the west or south in China, in an unmonitored parts of the or in unmonitored parts of the world such as India, Russia, South America, or most of Africa, we wouldn't know. Okay, but there were a couple stations that were that picked up that were here in these regions and it picked up the higher CFC eleven, allowed them allowed it to be determined determined that it was from China. Okay, um, and the paper that was published um, basically here uh, was uh, increase in CFC emission, 11 emissions from eastern China based on atmospheric observations. Okay, so it talks about the, the emissions from mainland China, um, how much they increased, and, you know, they basically, you know, it was, it's inconsistent with the Montreal Protocol to phase out global CFC production by 2010. Okay, so those are the key factors. Um, so let's go back to the paper, the specific paper, and have a look at what it's arguing. Okay, so we'll look at the images here. Okay, so the key thing is, is that the, these uh, ODSs, right, the ozone depleting substances, they've been, they were increasing, you know, over the period of 1955 to 2005, they were looked at when the atmospheric concentrations of the ODS increased rapidly. And then the models were run, and if the ODS was kept fixed, the warming in the Arctic on the surface and the sea ice loss in the Arctic were, would only be half as large as, as when these uh, guys, when these ODSs increased. And this change is not due to the absence or presence of ozone, because that was factored out. So this is a huge finding if it's validated in other studies. And I, I'm leaning towards it just be, it, it being correct. It just hasn't been looked at before. So I'll go through the paper um, in quite a bit of detail. So these ozone depleting substances, organic halocarbon compounds, they have long atmospheric lifetimes, like the CFCs, developed first in the 1920s and 30s by chemists to be used as refrigerants, solvents and propellants, they started being emitted in substantial quantities in the late 1950s. And they're the primary cause of stratospheric ozone depletion. So they were banned and production was cut for that reason. Right, the ozone hole over Antarctica, that, that discovery led to the phase out of the production of these things with the signing of the Montreal Protocol. But so as a result, the concentrations peaked in the late 20th century and have been declining since then, but they've had a profound impact on the climate system, according to this uh, paper, especially on the Arctic. OK, so they were mostly researched for their impacts on the ozone, but ozone depletion has not resulted in detectable surface temperature changes since its radiative forcing is very small. However, the polar stratospheric cooling accompanying the ozone hole is very large and has caused changes in the tropic circulation, many changes in the climate impacts, mostly in the southern hemisphere. Okay, so they're much less abundant than CO2, but they're much more powerful um, in terms of their global warming potential. So on, a, on CFC 11 and CFC 12 are 19,000 and 23,000 times more radiatively effective than CO2, um, resulting in 20-year global warming potential 7,000 and 11,000 fold larger than CO2. Okay, so the radiative forcing is high for these guys. Now they looked at 1955 to 20, 2005 because that's when the ODS concentrations grew rapidly. 
and the radiative forcing was estimated to be 0 0.31 watts per square meter, which is about a third of the radiative forcing from CO2, which is 1.02 watts per square meter, making ODS collectively the second most important greenhouse gas in the latter half of the 20th century. Okay, now Arctic surface temperatures have been rising over, tw over twice the global mean rate, and sea ice has been uh, correspondingly uh, re being reduced dramatically in terms of extent and thickness. Okay, so they asked the question, you know, how are these uh, guys affecting the Arctic? So first, so let's look at the figures. So this is the radiative forcing of CO2, you know, over time. This is uh, the radiative forcing of the ozone depleting substances here. And this is methane and this is nitrous oxide. So these guys are actually having a large effect and their production um, was tapered off after the Montreal Protocol. Okay, so that's the first key factor. And then they ran the models and they looked at what would happen in the Arctic. So this is a historical heating of the Arctic. This is between 1955 and 2005. This is the surface, uh, average surface temperature uh, change, Kelvin per decade increase. And you can see the, the huge increase in the Arctic surface temperature. And this is what you get in the model if you fix the ODSs, okay? If you fix the ODSs and the ozone, um, then this is what you get. And if you just fix the o ODS and let the ozone change as it has, you get this. So basically the clear difference is, is in the radiative forcing potential of these. And if you look at the sea ice extent, sea ice concentration percent per decade decline, you can see this is what has actually happened. But if, the, uh, if you fix the, the uh, ODSs and the ozone, this is what you would get. And if you just fix the ODS and the ozone was changing, this is what you'd get. So it's not the ozone change that is causing this effect. It's the greenhouse gas uh, effects of these uh, trace gases. So they do two different things, these ODSs, ozone depleting substances, not only to destroy the ozone, but they also cause tremendous warming. And this is the global temperature change in the historical. If you fix the ODS in the ozone, and if, and if you fix just the ODS, let the ozone vary. So these are very similar. So these gases are causing a significant amount of, of warming. This is the Arctic uh, surface temperature change. This is the global surface temperature change. And this is the September sea ice extent loss. So basically, um, and then they, they looked at different feedbacks as well in their study, okay? Um, and uh, then there is, uh, you know, the calculations and the appendices and so on. So they looked at different months and how the warming, global warming changed over different months. And the key thing is, is the historically it's much higher. If you fix the ODSs, it would be much lower global warming overall, much lower Arctic warming and the sea ice would, would be around, uh, would not have depleted as much, okay? So that's what all of this data is showing. You know, this is another way of putting it. This is historically what we saw. This is what would be expected if there were, if, if these ozone depleting substances were kept fixed at the 1955 level, the Arctic temperature change right, and the sea ice loss change. So basically, you know, this is a key study. This is sort of like a landmark study. And, uh, you know, this is a huge effect, you know, if it, if it pans out. Now, again, this is only one study. It needs to be looked at in more detail. So the key point is, is that the Arctic surface warming, the global surface warming, warming and the sea ice loss would be much smaller if we didn't have these ozone depleting substances rising in concentration. So it's extremely concerning that the CFC 11 has started to rise again over China in violation of the Montreal Protocol. So thank you for listening uh, to my videos. And again, please go to my website and check it out and consider donating to support my uh, efforts.
Thanks again.